Welcome, everyone, to our monthly uh, seminar on spirituality and health. And today we have Joan Romain speaking on the topic, the NIH Religion, Spirituality, and Health Scientific Interest Group Overview and Aspirations. So uh, Joan and I have known each other for several years now and have been partners in trying to, <laughs> trying to get this area into the view of NIH. And she's going to really go into that now. Joan uh, began at the NIH as a presidential management intern in 2001 and currently works as a health specialist at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, NIAAA, in the Division of Treatment and Recovery, Treatment Health Services Recovery Branch. She is founder and chair of the NIH Religion, Spirituality, and Health Scientific Interest Group and serves as co-chair of the Interagency Work Group on Drinking and Drug Use in Women and Girls. She developed the NIAAA Faith Leader Outreach Kit. Ms. Romaine holds a Master's of Public Health degree from George Washington University, Master's of Science degree in Clinical Mental Health Counseling, from Loyola University, Maryland's Department of Pastoral Counseling, and a dual BABS degree in pathology, excuse me, <laughs> a pathology. Same thing. Just yeah, <laughs> in psychology, <laughs> psychology <laughs> and advertising from Syracuse University's College of Arts and Sciences and the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, respectively. Ms. Romaine is a returned Peace Corps volunteer and served as a VISTA volunteer and a Mary Corps volunteer. Um, and so she has been very busy in her uh, years of service. So Joan, I'm going to turn over the reins to you. Welcome everyone to the uh, workshop and I hope we have a good discussion because Joan is the person to ask if you have any questions about NIH. So Joan. Well, thank you, Dr. Koning. And I'm just going to get my slides going here. Uh, give me one second. Let me make sure I can do this okay. Are you seeing my slides okay? Yes. Very oh, okay. good. Great. Great. Well, Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are from. Um, it's just such an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today, to have an opportunity to talk about something that I'm really uh, passionate about and is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm just very grateful to Dr. Koning for uh, his leadership in this area, for his mentorship um, and support as well. Um, and I'm just happy to see all of you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to be here. And I will do my best to share with you information about our group and how you can be involved. Uh, and um, I hope that this will be um, um, just sort of a fun, engaging um, presentation where we can discuss and I can get feedback from you at the end and answer any questions you may have. So with that said, how I'd like to structure our time together today is really just to kind of tell you a story. You know, I'd like to give you an overview of the religion, spirituality, and health scientific interest group, sort of our history, how we got started, our purpose, our aims, um, then our aspirations for the future. We're, we're nothing if not aspirational, right? Um, and then I know that there are probably some researchers on this call. I'm from NIH, so I feel compelled to try to share, you know, information with you that may be helpful. Um, I am a health specialist. I'm not a program officer, so I'm not working directly with grantees, although I have worked on uh, scientific pro um, programs um, that have worked with um with grantees, uh, there may be others on this call that have joined me from 
the NIH. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to share in the discussion and any questions you have as well. And we'll have time for that at the end. So before I start, I just like to get a, a, a pulse of the audience. How many of you are aware of this group at the NIH? Maybe show of hands. Let me open up my gallery here so I can see a little better. Okay, I do see some hands, very nice. Thank you, appreciate that. And I see some that aren't, so that's great too because it lets me know that hopefully I will share new information with you and you'll come away with uh, learning, learning some new things. I'm just clicking through so I can see who's here. And then second question, if you are aware of the Rush SIG, have you ever attended any of our events? Show of hands. Okay, not seeing many. So we need to do a better job, right, of communicating our events and making them available. But I do see, thank you, Dale, I see yours. Great. So let's, let's, let's dig in, as they say. I thought um, it would be important for me in giving you the background of our group um, is to really tell the story of the Rush SIG and how it all got started. And I want to uh, highlight the importance of supportive leadership. You know, one of the unsung heroes of this group is Dr. Ray Litton, who was my supervisor, and he is the director of the Division of Treatment and Recovery at the Alcohol Institute. And I can say without the support from Ray, my idea for this group, which was around the summer and fall of 2020, would never have come to fruition. I can remember talking with previous supervisors over years at NIH about you know, my interest in this. I was studying in the pastoral counseling department at the time um, and um, you know, it seemed like people thought it was a good idea, but no one was willing to sort of move the ball forward and help take it up. Um, but, um, but that changed when I began working with Ray. And what some of you may not know is Ray has really been a pioneer in this research area, having put out a funding announcement from NIAAA over 20 years ago on alcohol and spirituality something he did in collaboration with the Fetzer Institute. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the Fetzer Institute and other funding agencies like Templeton. <clears throat> and I included the RFA. If you wanna read it, you can Google this, just copy, you know, Google, uh, you can see the language. Um, and so we were able to fund some small awards from the Alcohol Institute. And my understanding, I wasn't at an IAAA at the time, but my understanding is what we weren't able to fund, Fetzer picked up. Um, so basically, what is, what is the story? So um, as you learned from my bio, I was studying pastoral counseling and clinical mental health counseling at Loyola in uh, Maryland. Um, this was going to be my retirement career. So I started studying it part time. And I was learning and reading about Dr. Koning and Dr. Pargament and others. And I kept thinking, you know, we need to be doing that here at the NIH. We need to be looking at this at the NIH. If we're going to be the best science and the best minds, how NIH likes to tout itself, you know, how come we weren't at the forefront of this? Um, and, you know, <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, you know, it wasn't until I started talking with Ray about my idea for formulating this group that it garnered some traction. And Ray is really um, dynamic and a doer and an encourager, and he supported me to take my idea forward to NIAAA leadership. And I'm really grateful that he did, because after pitching my idea to formulate this religion, spirituality, and health scientific interest group to Dr. Patricia Powell, the deputy director of NIAAA, and Dr. George Kube, the director of NIAAA, um, I received positive support from them to go forward um, and to pitch my idea <clears throat> for the group to Dr. Goddesman, who was then 
the NIH Intramural uh, Research Program Deputy Director who oversaw all the SIGs. So that brings me to getting approval from the NIH Office of Intramural Research. And why I wanted to tell you about this is because I think sometimes there's misunderstanding out there about what is the SIG. And I, so I want to help inform everyone about what we are and, and what we do and what what we can do, what we don't have the capacity to do, and also let you know that there are over, I want to say over 120 scientific interest groups at the NIH. So you may not be aware of that. You may want to go and look at the um, at the Office of Intramural Researchers Scientific Interest Group site and take a look at some of these other SIGs. There's, there's um, many in the behavioral sciences as well although the majority of them are more like the bench scientists, a bench um, basic science stuff. Um, and I also included on here this division, these two circles, intramural research in and ways. extramural research. Um, because I think, you know, it can be confusing even for people to know at NIH if you're working in intramural. Um, I will hear people say, like, I have no idea what the extramural research thigh does and vice versa. So I wanted to bring some clarity to the fact that all scientific interest groups at the NIH fall under the intramural research section of the NIH. And when we think of intramural research, we're really thinking about the folks um, who are actually doing the research at NIH. These are folks, for example, in Bethesda in the clinical center um, or in their labs doing the research versus the extramural research part of the NIH, which are program staff um, who are help um, guiding um, the priorities for research funding, helping to write the strategic plans for the institutes for research funding, helping to write and issue funding announcements. So the extramural research is all of the research that's funded outside to outside investigators, for example, academic institutions, et cetera. That's what the extramural research program is. And it's about 80% of the NIH overall budget. Um, so that's why they'll be a lot more program staff and people working in extramural research at these institutes and centers. But we still fall under intramural research. Um, let me see. One second. Okay. And with every scientific interest group, there's always co-advisors for intramural and extramural, as I explained, because of the two sections of the NIH. For ours, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ann Berger and Dr. Deirdre Roach to be our co-advisors. Um, many of you may know these individuals. Um, um, Dr. Ann Berger is an expert in pain and palliative care. She was a nurse oncologist who became a medical doctor. Um, she headed the division in the clinical center before she retired. She's now staying on as um, an NIH volunteer. So we're so grateful to still have her as part of our group. She brings a wealth of um, expertise to our group, as does Dr. Deirdre Roach, who's a senior medical um, program officer in the division of treatment and recovery. We're in the same division at NIAAA. And um, these two provide leadership to the group. They sit on our steering committee, and they're also part of our full group. Oops, sorry. Okay, so again, in telling the story and wanting to stress the importance of people, I wanted to show you the diversity of staff that are on our steering committee, and the diversity of staff, the diversity of institutes, um, and backgrounds. Um, you can see here, we have folks from the clinical center, that's what CC stands for. We have folks from the complementary and integrative health center, the Fogarty International Center, which focuses on training international researchers, the Allergy and Infectious Disease Institute, um, along with um, the 
uh, Cancer Institute. Um, so we have both some of the biggest institutes, there's 27 institutes and centers of the, at the NIH. We have some of the bigger ones, cancer and allergy and infectious disease. And we have some of the smaller ones like us, the alcohol uh, institute in terms of budget. You know, we're one of the smaller ones. We also have folks um, working at the clinical center um, who are seeing patients. Um, we have a chaplain who sits on our steering committee, Cantor Mike Zeusman. Um, I've wanted to recognize um, some of the previous members who have served um, on our steering committee and have sort of um, rotated off. Um, these are people that are obviously very committed to this area. I wanted you to feel like you had names and contacts at institutes. You know, if you're interested in cancer, you know, you can reach out to Dan um, and, you know, contact her. We have an email that comes to our steering committee, which I'll share at the end. So, you know, if you want to get in touch with anyone, you can simply send it to that email and we will either direct it to that person or it will go to the whole steering committee. But I think it's really important because NIH is such a huge place, you know, with thousands of people and a multitude of institutes and centers. I, I really wanted to have this time to help everyone feel connected, like they have people um, who are there. You know, we're here to serve the public. We're here to help um, and help connect you to people. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. Um, and um, our full group. So our full group is comprised of 70 members. This fluctuates um, and is growing um, from across the NIH from a myriad of different positions. You know, we have people from administrative staff, we have scientists, we have communications folks, policy folks, um, budget folks, uh, peer review folks. Again, it's just really a cross matrix of individuals who are interested in this. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about um, our meeting times and um, some of our activities and our aims. Um, again, connecting you to people. Um, we have a journal club coordinator, uh, Mr. Jason Wilson, who sits in the office of IRB operations. Our journal club has been going on for the last three years. Um, it's open to all of NIH. Um, we do it a few times a year. We initially started out thinking we would do it every month, but found that to be a lot on top of everything else that everyone's doing. I should mention, as I was saying in the beginning of the call, that um, everyone that's involved with this is really doing it above and beyond their um, normal work duties. You know, this is not a group that's charged to exist by the NIHOD. We are sort of self-created, um, um, uh, an informal group, if you will, um, although we are a formally a SIG and recognized as an approved scientific interest group of the NIH, you know, we, um, and I meant to tell you this earlier, sorry if I forgot, but, you know, we don't have a budget. Um, we're, you know, this isn't part of our performance evaluations. Everyone who's committing time to this is doing it above their already very busy schedule. Um, and Jason is, um, you know, I want to just, uh, give a formal thank you to him. I think he's on the call um, for doing a stellar job at leading us through um, discussing some of the peer reviewed literature out there to help us understand. And um, uh, he, can, he can talk more about that. Um, I'm gonna move on for the sake of time. Um, I wanna also recognize um, these individuals, Dr. Ranjan Gupta, Gupta and Dr. Gabriela Rosita, who are both also on our steering committee. Uh, Ranjan is from Fogarty and Gabriela is from the Cancer Institute. And we are trying to formulate a newsletter. It will never be as nice as Dr. Koenig's newsletter. <laughs> but uh, we'd like to have something to help people know what we're doing, what events we have coming up, how they can participate. Um, we really want to hear from all of you, you know, the public, researchers, others, about what 
can we be doing um, to help you? And, you know, we know funding is the top thing, right? But are there other things we could be doing that could be helpful to the field? Um, so we want to hear from you as well. We also want to share what we're doing. Um, myself, as uh, founding the group and serving as the chair of the steering committee and just trying to keep all the trains running on the track. I uh, just want to say, you know, I'm a great point person for anyone here. If you, you know, have any questions, I'm happy to try and help or direct you to people. And again, just want to encourage people that we want to hear from all of you. You know, we want to dialogue, we want to collaborate and however we can and help foster um whether it's networking events or talks um, or maybe panels or symposium, um, let us know um, so we can, you know, try to do these things together. Um, our group itself is limited um, to folks, what we call, we, we decided that if someone had an NIH email address, they could be part of the group. And this includes volunteers, this includes contractors, this in includes, um, um, fellows, et cetera. If someone has an, if they have a, an official sort of connection to NIH with an NIH email, then they can be part of our group. Our group meets monthly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're part, we're one of 22 social and behavioral scientific interest groups at the NIH. And um, there's a number of them. You may want to check them out. Maybe there are other interest groups that you're interested in as well, and you can see what they're doing. Um, I wanted to share with you our purpose. You know, this is what we came up with, um, you know, three plus years ago um, when uh, we started uh, was really to, as you can see, foster communication, promote collaboration and facilitate this exchange of information and understanding, et cetera, because we felt like, you know, NIH is primarily focused on biomedical research. And so, you know, we really needed to um, build an understanding and awareness and, um, you know, our own education um, and learning on um, what is out there and then help share it with others so we could uh, create that awareness for the importance of this, um, sort of build our own internal capacity for this um, and um, promote the understanding of this research literature, uh, pulling from the Jesuit traditions of, you know, care for the entire person, um, you know, focusing on uh, cura personalis or, you know, we know uh, the, um, complementary and integrative health um, strategic plan uh, just uh, is talking about whole person health. So there are different names for this, but um, we think it's really important. We know all of you do too. Um, and, you know, this is part of our aspirations. We would like to see it move from sort of a biomedical model to a biopsychosocial spiritual model when we're talking about care, when we're talking about research. Um, and we think our work really does contribute to the overall mission of the NIH. We think it also can help address health disparities, promote health equity. Um, so we think um, what we're doing is really important. And, um, you know, we think it's really in line with the goals of the NIH. Um, these were the aims that we came up with when we started. Um, Again, you know, really the number one thing is to foster research, you know, um, uh, we, again, we're not a fun, you know, we don't fund research, we don't even put out um, initiatives, funding announcements, but what we hope is that by shining a light on the importance of this and the merit of this work, and um, that we can um, help stimulate um, research um, and, and research activities at the different institutes and centers of the NIH um, and encourage the development of funding opportunities. Um, I'll say this later, but, you know, um, investigators can always send something in um, to the NIH as an investigator initiated, you know, application. Um, but it would be nice if there were um, funding announcements that went out that were specific to uh, looking at these areas vis-a-vis -vis the 
the disease or condition that the different institutes focus on. Um, we would like to highlight the opportunities and gaps and make recommendations for leadership. When we first started, um, Dr. Collins did kick off um, our first talk for the group and you know, suggested that we come back to him um, with recommendations. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, he stepped down as director, but this is something that we still have in mind. We have a new director now, and you know, we hope that she will be open to um, you know, this this kind of work. Um, in our first uh, few years, we took time sort of uh, creating our website and we have an internal teams group where we've pulled together measurement tools, we've pulled together expert speakers, um, um, institutes and centers that are doing this across the US, um, conferences of interest, training resources, really, again, to educate our NIH community on these things so they would have things available. You know, I think one of the things we would hear is, oh, well, you know, there aren't good measurement tools or, oh, well, you know, the research isn't this or that. So um, we know that's not the case and we want to try to demonstrate to others um, that these things do exist because others aren't aware. Um, we also would like to help share in communicating um, opportunities, whether there are opportunities for training, whether there are opportunities for conferences, um, again, um, to help facilitate the exchange of information um, and one of the things that we have been doing um, is hosting seminars um, and bringing in expert speakers like Dr. Koning and others so that we can educate the NIH and the public um, who you know, might uh, listen to something that we're putting out there um, on this important body of research and what we, what we know and what we still need to know. Um, we would like to... Um, organize more networking events. You know, some of the ideas we have is our, um, you know, trying to um, organize things around other conferences, you know, sort of satellite opportunities or something um, or um, panel discussions that maybe we can sponsor and bring in experts. Um, and But again, um, I would love to hear all of your ideas for what could be useful. One second. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, here's where I wanted to cue the David Bowie changes song, you know, ch -ch -ch changes, this is what we want, we want changes, you know, we really want to move the needle, you know, we want to see that research in this area is prioritized, and part of the whole person health model at every institute and center, and you know, I think that we already have a framework for this. Um, you know, I worked a lot in HIV AIDS at the NIH, and so I'm very familiar with how um, the HIV AIDS is coordinated at the NIH and how there's a separate set aside budget from Congress for HIV AIDS funding, how every institute um, at the NIH gets funding for AIDS research, has an AIDS coordinator, and it's coordinated at the OD level. I would love to see the NIH use that model for shaping and creating and implementing, you know, religion and spirituality and health um, research at the NIH. I think we have a successful model and framework, and I would love to see that happen. And I'm going to keep talking about it, <laughs> you know, until maybe it happens. <laughs> um, but we would also, you know, in addition to funding opportunities, we would love um, to see there be funding put out for training opportunities for fostering the pipeline of researchers and the development of um, up and coming and, and existing researchers in this field or those who, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, want to take it on. Maybe they've been doing something else and, and are, you know, this has piqued their interest. So not just early career, but, you know, really anyone. Um, and again, when I say awareness and education and competency, I'm really talking about like within our NIH community, right? We have a lot of work st still to do, you know, um, about um, sort of uh, 
promoting this and talking about its importance and um, uh, helping to make it a priority. Um, and consideration and inclusion, I, I, you know, I think this is really important and I think this is where um, we perhaps could be a low hanging fruit, you know, if we're looking at, <clears throat> you know, things that NIH um, either are going to fund or have funded, you know, do they have questions in there, you know, on religion, spirituality and health? And when I say religion, spirituality and health, I mean, whatever disease or health <laughs> um, condition is, since we have, you know, a bunch of different centers and institutes. Um, so just sort of plug in what it is. Um, you know, can we go back to existing studies, um, you know, and look at the protocols and see if they can, you know, add in some questions so that we can get data? Um, what about all the repositories and data that we already have? Can it be mined? You know, are there um, these questions in there so that, um, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel and um, we're being cost effective. And do researchers have, um, do they have access to this, you know? Um, so here's some uh, selected activities um, that we have done. Um, uh, Dr. Koning and others participated in a workshop we had at the very beginning um, because one of the first things we talked about was, you know, what are the definitions, you know, religion and spirituality or, or religiosity? Is there agreement? How can we measure this? How can we build upon, you know, um, existing research, et cetera? Um, and as I mentioned, pulling together the various um, measurement tools, you know, I'm going to show a resource later, the Phoenix Toolkit, and um, nothing against the Phoenix Toolkit, but there's only two RS measurement tools in there. And having taken Dr. Koenig's training, I would say at least one of them, he might not think is like the greatest. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think though, this is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity for people to consider um, submitting their measurement tool and seeing if it can be included, right? Um, these are resources that, you know, NIH has a, a big audience and a lot of people are looking at these things and could be very va valuable for the field. Um, uh, we've, you know, identify and continue to identify and we look for your help in helping uh, recommend and identify speakers or topics that you think, you know, we should hold talks on. Um, <clears throat> we have talked with other funders like folks at Fetzer, folks at John Templeton Foundation to see if there are things we can do in the future to collaborate together. Um, we are meeting and have met with other leadership groups at the NIH, including NIH Unite, if you're not aware of it. This is a big um, ending structural racism initiative that NIH put out under Dr. Collins. And it includes different, the acronym UNITE stands for different subcommittees of that group. Um, I served on the N committee, which was new research. Um, and um, there's a lot of um, other things that are coming out of um, the NIH UNITE. And there's a whole website on it. If you're not familiar, you can just Google it and sort of read what they're doing and looking at what they're looking at. Um, there's also the NIH All of Us, which if you haven't heard of, um, that's like a huge longitudinal study um, that's going on. Um, again, Google it. There's a website you can read more. Um, as I mentioned, we've held journal clubs. We co-sponsored a journal club with NIAAA has a race and medicine interest group. Um, and that was a good way for us to sort of get our name out there also. Um, and one of the important things um, that we've done internally is we've worked with NIH's um, RCDC to have more religion and spirituality terms added to the thesaurus, right? That's on the back end, right? Um, but um, this way, when NIHers either internally or externally um, uh, are looking for what projects have been funded, for example, or doing trying to do some searching for program analysis, um, they might have resultantly now a better 
search result, right? Because a lot more terms were actually added that weren't even in there before, or more accurate as well, more comprehensive. Um, I asked folks in our group, you know, tell me what you think our accomplishments are. And these were just a few that came in. Um, you can see, you know, elevating the importance of this area at the NIH as huge. Um, the journal clubs and the lectures we provide. Um, you know, I also, oops, I also had one come in as of, uh, you know, later um, talking about from someone who was a, a chaplain and talking about how often in his work, these issues are never addressed, you know, at the NIH. And, um, and so having this group really, really helped um, sort of uh, bring it to bear. Um, some of our future plans, we will be convening an internal retreat next month to really sort of dream for the future um, and explore, you know, what we can do. Again, you know, we're open to ideas. I'd love to hear from all of you how you think we can be helpful. Um, if there are things that you would like to do with us, um, we will be setting up um, seminars again for the fall. I mentioned Dr. Collins will be speaking on election day. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully uh, that will be something uh, good and uh, to look forward to. I know it will for Dr. Collins. And um, we will also be participating. The NIH Intramural Program has a research festival every year. Uh, we participated last year for the first time. And we thought, although we didn't have a lot of people attend our workshop, we still thought it was really important for our group to get the visibility of our group being there. Um, and also the fact that we were accepted as a group because not every, they don't have room for you know 120 different uh, scientific interest groups participating. So the fact that we had a workshop, we thought it was really um, great for us and we're gonna plan to do it again and tell people more um, about our group. Um, very quickly, cause I wanna end soon so we can have time to talk. Um, I asked Dr. Madeline Halula from our group, um, uh, you know, what information do you, do you think, you know, would be helpful for researchers? And she said, well, you know, tell them that NIH is different from other funding sources. And what she means is NIH funds projects rather than people. And, um, you know, that this small difference in words can have a large impact in how you write an application and also that effective in January, 2025, um, there's a new simplified review criteria. Um, and you can find out more on those links there um, and they're listed here. And it looks like um, instead of the five areas there, um, there are gonna be three factors. So you can look online to get more information on that one and make you aware. Um, in addition, as I mentioned, you know, uh, from Dr. Gabriella Rosetta, you know, let them know investigators can apply using investigator initiated application, you know. Um, so, um, you know, what I would encourage everyone is to talk to program staff at the institutes and centers you're interested in. Don't ever send in an application, you know, cold <laughs> or blind, if you will. Um, you know, talk to the program staff. If you're not sure who they are, you know, you can look up at the bottom of the funding announcement, for example, and they'll be listed there, reach out to them. I would also recommend people attend the Institute or Center Advisory Council meetings. You know, these happen a few times a year. They can get a better understanding of what the priorities are scientifically for these groups. Um, they can get an update on um, things that have been funded. Um, and just learn more about, um, you know, the different um, program staff and 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 the and the initiatives that they're funding and the work that they're doing. Um, if you haven't used um, the reporter, I think I have a slide on it. Um, 
you know, you can check that and see what has been funded. You might not be aware of, and there might be someone in your state, for example, who's doing something in the same area, or maybe not even in your state, but you can contact them and maybe collaborate with them. Um, read the strategic plans of the institutes you're interested in. You know, if you're interested in alcohol, um, our new strategic plan link is there, and I'm happy to say we have included language um, looking at alcohol and religion and spirituality, et cetera. And um, I think it's under goal four with the treatment and recovery stuff. So I'm very, you know, happy and proud that we got that language in there and reach out and ask, you know, we're really here to help. NIH program staff are here to help. Um, you know, my first uh, manager out of college said, Joan, business is a series of relationships. And it's true, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to do is have all of you feel like you at least had a sense of who people were and where they sat. So you had some contacts you could reach out to. Um, if you're not aware of the NIH report and reporter tools, here's a link to them here. They're great for looking at uh, things that have been funded um, in, your, in what you might be interested in, in your state, et cetera. Um, and this is the Phoenix Toolkit, which has protocols and measurement tools in it. Take a look. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, just click through the different seminars we've held so you get an idea. Most of the links of these are available on our website if you want to watch them. Um, you can see I mentioned the kickoff from Dr. Collins and then Dr. Eve Nemesango from Africa our very own, both um, Dr. Ann Berger and Dr. Rezvan Amili. And then I'm sure you know uh, this person, if not both of these people, thank you again, Dr. Koning. And I'm sure some of these will also be familiar faces. And, um, you know, we're really, again, just trying to bring in the experts, educate our audiences, help people connect, give people uh, shine a little light on folks. Um, here's how you can stay in touch with us. We do have, uh, for those outside of the NIH, we have an external listserv you can join and you can share information with others on it. The numbers are small, but it's growing. And just thank you. Uh, hope I didn't run through things too fast and now I'm remembering things I wanted to say. So sorry, but hopefully we'll have time for some discussion and answers. Thank you, Joan. What a terrific presentation, an overview of the special interest group. Now, um, why don't we um, why don't we open it up for discussion? I mean, just just uh, raise your hand and uh, or unmute yourself and ask your question to Joan. I'm sure people must have questions. Now's the time. Joan, can you unshare your screen? Yep. Yep, I'm going to do that now. Uh, there, did that go away? Very good. Looks like Dale has unmuted himself. Dale, uh, you're up. Hey, Joan, thanks very much for your presentation. I am uh, on the listserv, and I think we've interacted a few times. As you're probably aware, and your team is aware, the NCCIH <clears throat> has recently considered adding spirituality as a domain to their whole person health model. Um, I listened to one of their last advisory council meetings and they have a small group that's studying the feasibility and, and whether it's appropriate to add spirituality. They seem to be struggling with this. Are you or any members of your SIG actively involved in an effort to influence them in a positive way to make spirituality a domain in their model? Thank you. Thank you, Dale. I'm, I'm looking, we actually have someone on our steering committee from that institute. So we have talked about these things internally I'm trying to see who's here. I don't know if Christina is here, if she wants to say anything. Um, I do not see her. Um, yeah, I, 
I, you know, I, like I said, I can say that we do have someone on our steering committee um, who sits in that institute um, and unfortunately she's not here to respond. Um, we also, you know, I don't think Dr. Ray Litton is on who also sits on our steering committee who, you know, I think has um, had some talks uh, with the deputy director, but I don't have sort of, um, I would I, uh, the short answer is, um, I would say right now, no, not a formal other than what they have, but I'm gonna, you know, m mark your point. Um, and it's certainly something we can discuss at our next meeting and retreat. Um, but we do have someone who sits on our steering committee from that institute. Okay. My, understand, my understanding is that they are uh, creating a coalition um, to look at that effort. And I would encourage you know, members of your group to uh, apply to be part of that coalition so that this um, interest can be well represented and influence their efforts in a positive way. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dale. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your recommendation. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, you know, I wish more members <laughs> were on that, you know, from the Institute that could speak more directly from internally from there, but I will bring this up with our, with our steering committee. And it's something we can certainly discuss and, and see you know, what we could do. Thank you. Faye, you're, you're next, you're up next. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, I'm Faye Calhoun. It's been 20 years since I presented. Hi, uh, Faye, I remember you from my first year at NIAAA. <laughs> okay. So it's been 20 years and if you go way back to the beginning of this organization, of this, this center, of spirituality and theology at, at Duke University. You'll find my picture on the front cover of the annual meeting, I think, because I made us, you know, presented alcohol and spirituality at that meeting and had a great time. And I was presenting because at the time I was the leader of uh, a spirituality and alcohol for the NIAAA, and I, uh, NIH organization. We uh, at that time were able to do a lot of work in this area. Uh, we were partnering with the Fetzer Institute, which is in Michigan, and uh, we had several retreats where I would invite the uh, researchers, groups of researchers, to come up to uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, I believe, mm -hmm. and have a retreat for several days and to, to talk and discuss this and, and understand how our research could be, could address this issue, et cetera. And what came out of that was an RFA, uh, the one of the first, the first RS, RFA at NIH on spirituality and a particular disease, this one being alcohol, alcoholism and alcohol abuse. And uh, we funded, we were able to fund a, a number of applications and uh, and move on. So I'm, I was so excited when I saw this topic come up for a uh, presentation uh, uh, at, 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 you know, at, at, with the center this time. And I was hoping by this time we would talk about uh, the progress that has, that has been made in research and where the research field is going. Um, like I said, 20 years ago, we had the Fetzer Institute. We had uh, National Association of Children of Alcoholics and AA, all of those involved in spirituality and alcohol, uh, addressing uh, uh, alcohol abuse and alcoholism and through working on spirituality of the individual and uh, had a great old time. So uh, I don't know what has happened. Have there been any other RFAs? Uh, if not, why not? And uh, can we, is it possible to move this forward? Uh, we had a lot of attention, some organizations, uh, some other institutes involved in what we were doing at that time. So uh, I would love to have a list of uh, 
a compendium of any uh, research, the, the results of any research uh, that addressed alcohol and spirituality uh, since my time. I retired in 2006 and uh, as the deputy director of the Institute and just kind of wonder what, what the seeds I sowed uh, uh, resulted in. So uh, that's my question. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Dr. Calhoun. You know, I wish Deirdre and Ray were on the call. Um, and thank you for sharing that history. I did not know that part. I, I knew uh, from Ray his part, and I'm sorry I did not know your part, but thank you so much for your pioneering efforts. I got to include your picture on my slide. Um, uh, but, you know, we can certainly take a look. I'm unfortunately, you know, the the bit that I know is there was a lot of interest generated and applications that came in. And uh, I don't know that much more happened after that, unfortunately. Um, you know, it was before my time. I can certainly look at what publications came out of that. You know, we probably have that information in Reporter but I'm not really aware of subsequent funding announcements that went out um, from NIAAA after that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. well, we also had training uh, modules and training courses for pastors and people in the community that uh, wanted to address this in their organizations. And I did several presentations and talks uh, to those groups uh, with the training uh, model, I think, uh, the core was the one. Uh, Children of Alcoholics was the one that came out with it. I had, I have one here <laughs> in my house. Fortunately, uh, training module for uh, individuals who are working with uh, churches. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that was a fairly good history uh, before I left. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that uh, it didn't just explode after that. I'm going to talk with Ray about what happened. But, you know, I am aware that uh, the Aging Institute, I think, was also involved uh, when you were working on that with Fetzer. Um, and yeah, you know, we're trying, <laughs> we're trying to kind of harness people up and, and get them back involved. I see um, Renee has a question. Renee, I think. Yes, thank you, Joan. For um, I'm a I'm a doctor from Switzerland, and I just wonder what is your do you have some kind of international perspective or some kind of perspective to to relate to maybe European countries or to support European uh, networks? We, we have uh, European uh, boards. Uh, we meet regularly, and I just wonder how we could uh, interact. Well, thank you. Um, we're happy to interact and meet with folks. Again, we're not a funder. You know, we 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 don't have the ability to fund. We have a lot of money in Europe, so we don't we don't need money. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it it would um, be great. Um, you know, if maybe uh, if you can drop your email in the chat, I'm happy to follow up. Yeah. Um, it would be great to set up a Zoom call with you, your group, and our steering committee, and 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 talk and um, you know see what we can do. You know, uh, thank you for sharing. Okay. So, where, where can I find your email? It's where can I find your I, email? I can drop it in the chat um, if okay. that's helpful. Yeah, this would be nice. And if you have any trouble, Renee, getting it out of the chat, just let me know and I'll send you uh, okay. Joan's email. Uh, Harold is also part of our European community. So he Wonderful. Will... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Who would like to tap into this tremendous source of knowledge that that we have here with us? We've got five, six minutes. So for a couple of more questions, if uh, if any of you have any. Or any observations that you'd like to make. 
I would also add, uh, thank you, Dr. Koning, if anyone from our group is on the call, if they want to provide input or if I've missed anything or please share uh, your feedback as well. I see Jennifer has a hand up. Uh, yes. Hi, sorry, I'm Jennifer Shearer. I'm a nephrologist and palliative care doctor. Um, I have a RO3 that's being scored, I think, tomorrow <laughs> that involves its spirituality and kidney disease. I was wondering if you've had any um, interactions with the NIDDK or any sense of, of their, their interest in this field? Um, we don't have anyone on the steering committee in NIDDK. I don't have the full list in front of me. Um, I could certainly look after um, and see if there's anyone uh, from there. If you want to be in touch with me, um, mm -hmm. you know, I could certainly look and if we do have someone point you to them. Um, but sorry, I don't know offhand. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I see Bruce has a hand up. Yes, um, Dr. Koenig, I wanted to, I'll take you up on your offer to speak. I was, uh, I'm a, a physician and a chaplain and clinical professor at Stanford University at the School of Medicine, and where I provide spiritual care for uh, 25 years and uh, education. So uh, our interest is in, I, I guess it's more introductory, uh, just to throw my hat in the ring. I'm so uh, thrilled to see what you're doing. Uh, I really am and uh, and welcome that. Um, our interests here are, uh, we've been integrating uh, spirituality, including a reflection rounds into the medical curriculum for um, um, uh, over two decades. Uh, we have a lifestyle medicine project, a major one here at Stanford, which has now introduced a pillar that deals with religion, spirituality. It goes under the name uh, religion. It goes under the name reflection and gratitude uh, as the nose that goes into the camel's tent. Uh, and more theoretically, we're developing an approach, um, de uh, developing an approach uh, that deals with the ontological basis of being itself the structure of being from an ontological perspective that's a basis both for the biology of medicine and includes the uh, religion and spirituality. Um, so that's an area of, of uh, interest. And a notion that um, I've coined, that we've coined called not just the stem cell, but the stem soul mm -hmm. as a basis that people have been finding very useful as an approach to bridge uh, the science into the religion spirituality and for people to recognize their humanity as a basis of connection with uh, other people. And it really shows up and we're all, and we're interested in the, uh, the you know, we're practitioners interested in the pragmatics mm -hmm. and the, uh, the practice and the quote application or integration of these uh, notions. So I'm interested in um, who might be, uh, who I might contact to learn more about what you already know in this area of ontology related to religion, spirituality. Um, we have a, a research project on, that studied our reflection rounds, a doctoral dissertation. So um, I, I, that's me. And I just wanna say thank you again for inviting us and making this possible. Like, uh, uh, you talked about the David Bowie ch -ch -ch changes. I just want to also say, you know, like, go team. How good to see the development of this. It's slow, but it's really impactful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Feldstein. And I would just um, invite you to please send me an email and I'll share it with our, our group uh, to figure out who best to kind of point you to. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for the work you're doing. And I love your coined term, the stem cell. So, uh, stem soul. Yeah. 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 Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks Bruce for your comment. And, uh, okay, Harold, may I call you Harold? Yo, sure. You can. Sure. You can. <laughs> yeah. Love you, man. <laughs> we'll be in touch. I need to get All your right, email. All right, let's do it. <laughs>
Maybe you can give one of these talks someday. I think I'm glad to give a talk. Okay, uh, I got you on record now for that. All right. Well, no, seriously, let's talk. Maybe I think there's something good we could conjure up here. Uh, good. I'd love to. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, we are close to one o'clock. One last question. If somebody's got a question or would like to uh, say, make a statement, but uh, we are at one o'clock. And so I want to, first of all, just thank Joan tremendously for her presentation today and for her leadership in all of this. You know, it's been so exciting to work with her and, you know, to have her share all of what she's been doing you know, at NIH, uh, such important work. So thank you, Joan. And thank you, everybody here who has made observations and asked questions on the call. And we will see you all then um, next month. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye.